Good morning, everybody. We'll be getting started with the next session led by Youth for Climate. And thank you to um, to the previous session for the very interesting content. Clearly, it's uh, generated a lot of discussion. <laughs> So um, perhaps I'll get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, a warm welcome also to those who are joining us online. I saw um, when I last checked, there were more than 100 people online. Um, so hopefully we can get some, uh, some of their uh, feedback as well during the session. Uh, my name is Roxani Rushas. Uh, I coordinate the Youth for Climate program at UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. Uh, Youth for Climate as a program kicked off uh, in September as a partnership between UNDP and the government of Italy, uh, building on recommendations from the Youth for Climate Manifesto of 2021, um, which I know many of you in this room uh, also contributed to in the lead up to, to COP26. A core objective of Youth for, for Climate as of this year is to support youth-led climate solutions on the ground. Uh, so in this session, we'll be talking about what it takes. Uh, well, first of all, we'll be sharing uh, with you the funding opportunities that we've, we've opened up and some other opportunities open to you and your networks um, through UNDP. Uh, but we'll also be talking uh, about what it takes to nurture grassroots solutions into scalable programming. Um, uh, and uh, and many thanks to the Youth for a Capacity program, our sister initiative at UNFCCC for, for opening up this opportunity us, for us. Um, importantly, um, when we talk about scaling at UNDP, um, we don't necessarily only mean scaling in reach and numbers, but also uh, we talk about scaling deep uh, or bringing about change by shifting the deeper values, cultural beliefs, meanings and practices of uh, communities. Uh, and here there's a lot that we're learning from UNDP's network of accelerator labs, which cover 115 countries around the world, uh, through which uh, we're investing in reimagining the way we do sustainable development by tapping into the power of those local solutions and really recognizing that the knowledge and expertise of those who are closest to the problem matters most. Uh, to set the scene for our discussion, I'd like to just show you the trailer of a documentary called For Tomorrow uh, that this network has produced to celebrate exactly this grassroots thinking approach. Our planet is facing sustainability challenges like we've never seen before. From climate change, to pollution, to social inequality, people are rising to these challenges with ingenuity, resilience and vision. Más o menos ya va a ser como 10 años que nos está afectando bastante. We are not accessible world. Unfortunately. We have big problem with electricity. How can we fix this? Where do we begin? We don't have the answers, but some might. It's the people closest to the problem who have the most knowledge about that problem. Mighty oaks come from small acorns. And the seeds of the smallest ideas, once nurtured, can change the world. This is the power of grassroots innovation. 
the power of local change makers taking real actions to help those around them. Emmanuel has just created Sierra Leone's first locally made solar powered car that is eco friendly. We have seen what's possible when we act as one. When we recognize great things can come from humble beginnings. When we dream together. When we innovate together. When we empower each other. The question is always, what can one person do to save the world? An equally important question is, what do 8 billion people know? Uh, and the full documentary is available to watch on, on YouTube. Uh, very much, very much recommend it. So um, on this theme, uh, great things come from humble beginnings. Um, joining me to share insights and, and learnings are, uh, first off, representing Yango, who are a member of the Youth for Climate Advisory Committee, and specifically representing Yango's Finance and Markets uh, Working Group. We have Erika Shananin Calvillo Ramirez, uh, Erica is an indigenous uh, Giwa descendant from Mexico and a Latin American studies student. Uh, she's a climate justice and plant-based food systems advocate. And from UNDP, we have uh, two colleagues, uh, Cassie Flynn, uh, who is our head of climate policy and strategies, and Agostino Ngusho, who's the coordinator of UNDP's Rome Center for Climate Action and Energy Transition, uh, which uh, serves as the secretariat of the Youth for Climate program. Um, so we'll be structuring this conversation around uh, a framework developed by a group of students at Columbia University um, in collaboration with UNDP. Um, uh, which highlights three key pillars um, for what it takes to get an individual solution to impact. And these are firstly the contextual factors. Uh, that influence the emergence of a solution and the ability to deploy it, so basically the enabling environment. Uh, secondly, the characteristics that make up an innovation, an innovative solution that is fit for purpose in a given local context. And thirdly, the factors that ultimately will influence the success and impact of a solution longer term. So to start with the, this first pillar, uh, the contextual factors. Um, we know that financial resources um, are one of the most important factors in the enabling environment that influence whether a solution can be deployed. Um, young people have repeatedly uh, asked for more uh, funding for, for their work on the, on the ground. Um, so, Agostina, perhaps we could start with you sharing a little more about the um, funding opportunities that we're opening up through Youth for Climate starting this year. Um, what do young people need to need to know about this? Thank you. Thank you for all of you to be here and uh, for uh, the gracious hosting, of course, our colleagues from UNFCCC and uh, Roxani, since, you know, everyone was moving around uh, at the time. Once again, she's the coordinator of the Youth for Climate Initiative. And so thank you also for sharing us. So uh, essentially, the, in, 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 the, in the context of um, this video, right, so what do we do to understand context better? You know, in the UNDP, we listen to people, right? And so the message that came from, uh, from young people across the world in terms of the contextual and enabling environment was loud and clear. And the first requirement was more capacity, both in terms of finance and uh, other types of enablers. So let's start with finance, as Roxani was saying. So this year, Youth for Climate is funding solutions through an innovation challenge in uh, four areas urban sustainability, food and agriculture, energy and climate education. And the call for solutions is now closed at the end of the month of March. And we received over 1,100 applications. 
And uh, the call for solutions will provide financial rewards for uh, the winners that will be selected in October during the Youth for Climate conference that will take place in, um, in Rome in Italy. And out of the um, 1,100 applicants, we expect to have in Rome uh, 100 uh, shortlisted candidates. And out of them, uh, roughly um, half of them will receive uh, funding. So the funding that was pledged to this particular initiative, again, by the, the government of Italy, which is the donor for the uh, program, is uh, 1 million euros. So it's quite substantial, but of course, it's not enough, right? So here the question is, how do we, um, how do we present these uh, applications, these solutions, in a way that then can attract more funding and be uh, created in a sort of system, right? And here, this also drove our identification of the candidates for this, right? So the proposals are led um, by young people between the age of 18 and 29, and they're open to national UNDP program countries, so over 170 countries in the world. And in the applications, we had this focus on both the strong project proposals of 1,000 words and budget and so forth, but you know, with this idea, right, of creating an open uh, playing field, also uh, video, audios, right, there are various means through which the applications can be received. So, the, as we said, the application run for this year is finished, but we're really looking forward to like harvest, uh, feedback, learning, and open a new application round already at the end of this year, right? So the, the pace of applications will speed up. So thank you, Roxanne. Uh, thanks. And uh, so Agostino mentioned this year, we've been funding four areas. Um, so climate education, food and agriculture, energy and urban sustainability. Um, we'll have a different scope uh, as uh, in the next round uh, of the call for solutions. Uh, so I'd just like to invite the audience also to contribute on, on Menti. You can go to menti.com and use the code 91323388. 91323388. And you can share with us um, what are some of the areas you would like to see Youth for Climate funding in the next round of the call for solutions, also based on needs you're hearing from your networks. Um, now, Cassie, of course, uh, access to finance and other contextual factors, so for instance, access to technologies or uh, access to the right kinds of training programs, um, that's, all that is also highly dependent on enabling policies being, being in place. Uh, so as an expert in the policy sphere, what's your advice to, to young delegates uh, in the room uh, when it comes to advocating for that enabling environment for youth-led solutions? Thank you, Roxani, and and thank you. It, it's such a such a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think, you know, something that is so important about this is is the ability to help people with good ideas to realize those good ideas, and that's when you need, of course, the financing, and you need uh, you need support, you need partnerships. Um, you need the right environment, as we talk about, the right enabling environment to be able to to be able to thrive. Um, and this is something that we are very, very committed to, um, and we have seen not just because it's it's something we believe in, but because this environment can make or break whether a good idea can be scaled up um, or face an immense number number of challenges. And in the case of youth, this is this is incredibly important because. Young people play such a unique role in the climate crisis. And we see so much in the headlines and advocacy and really pushing leaders, and this is really fantastic. And now we have to complement this with support for the good ideas that young people have. Um, and even Eric and I, were, we were talking last night about some of the, the really incredible work that's, that's going on around the world. And being able to advocate not just for um, those direct resources, but, but that enabling environment. And within the climate promise, you know, this is something that UNDP has, uh, uh, that launched a, a few years ago, and we have supported 127 countries and DCs. 85% of the developing world has received support in, from the climate promise in, in one way or another. And 
we have been very committed to uh, uh, really trying to support young people to be as engaged in this process as, uh, as possible um, because we've seen a direct correlation between the successes of those NDCs and the level of ambition of those NDCs with the levels of inclusion, including with young people um, in, in those conversations. And so within that, there's a lot of pathways. Uh, there's getting involved with, uh, I, you know, with these, these NDC policy conversations. There's the fact that you're here as a part of these negotiations. There's um, a, you know, the ability to start to uh, bring your voices to the ways that these decisions are made in a way that can help you uh, be able to access the type of support um, uh, that, that you need. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, we we are we are very very committed to, and something that uh, we're looking forward to scaling up um, as much as possible with all of your help. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Cassie, and and thanks for the great ideas that are coming up on screen. And great to great to see that some of the areas we're supporting um, uh, this year are still very much uh, prominent on your uh, among your priorities. Um, Shannon, um, listening to to Cassie and Agostino, uh, maybe to come in from the perspective of Younger's uh, working group on on finance and markets, um, what are you learning in that in that working group about the key factors that that shape this enabling environment? What are your some of your priorities in that working group? Yes, in the working group of climate and finance of Yongo, we are actually now trying to create this climate finance reporting training, which is like an open call still, and through where we actually want people to build the capacities and to be more engaged in these scenarios. So I think that this environment, that the one we are creating here and all these events, are like the places where the people who are already leading the solutions are actually meeting the people, you know, with the funding, with everything, all the resources and platforms to scale those solutions. So yeah, I believe that as young people and as we are the ones of the most vulnerable to the climate crisis, it is in these spaces where in order to defend our life, the solutions are being created. So yeah, I believe the solutions already exist at the grassroots level in the communities. So yeah, what we need are more of these spaces where actually funders, actually the representatives of the UN and people with that, all these amazing leaders meet. So yeah, I believe that uh, with Yongo, we are also trying to create more of these spaces. So yeah, also in here, the. Uh, the team that is covering and that is supporting the ESBs is actually also trying to build all those networks. Super, thank you. Um, so to move on maybe to that second pillar of that, of that framework that we saw, um, we've, we've talked about the enabling environment that allows solutions to emerge in the first place, but then how do we also make sure that that enabling environment is supporting the right kinds of solutions in any given context. Uh, so Cassie, going back to you, maybe there's another funding opportunity that we have at UNDP that's very important for, for young people, the, the small grants program. Um, how, how is that, could you maybe share with us how, how that is set up to empower communities to, um, to participate in the decision making around mm -hmm. which solutions are relevant in, in any given context? Absolutely. Um, some of you may, may know about the about the small grants program. Um, it has been around for, for many, many years. And um, the idea is to be able to support communities to uh, be able to take action on a number of different topics, in, in including uh, on climate. And um, to really shorten the distance between discussions like this at the at the global level um, to what communities are are uh, are experiencing and and seeing and um, one of the there's a few lessons learned out of this that I think um, are really important as, as we're all thinking about this this work moving forward, um, because I think it's easy to talk about this. It's easy to it's easy to say, oh, we need to we need to connect this, we need to support. But when you get to the details of that, and when you get to what um, what actually has to happen, um, we have to be very mindful about this. We have to be very mindful from uh, uh, not just the processes that we create, but ensuring that they are as inclusive as possible and, um, and even with languages and um, making sure that we're meeting communities where, where they are. 
Um, a, a few pieces to this. Um, one that is very, very critical is, of course, community ownership. Um, really taking the lead uh, from communities. Um, they know their context best. They know the solutions that they want. Uh, and, and to be able to support that um, and to support that in a way that isn't uh, just about sort of one-off solutions, but how do you do this over a long period of, uh, a long period of time? And really investing in that. Um, being able to invest uh, in on the ground, being able to invest in um, that are trying to uh, build their communities um, in a way, and, and in particular, they're facing the climate crisis uh, uh, that is on that is on their doorstep. Being integrated across uh, from the from the global, regional, national levels, being able to connect um, communities with each other, to be able to share ideas, share resources, share energy in, in being able to, to, to pull this off. Um, there's a, a, a lot of communities that can be, and leaders that can be learning from each other because they may be facing some of the same struggles, um, may be facing some of the same opportunities that they can then be leveraged for, for each other. And then, of course, being able to have innovation. Um, and to some extent, it's also about being able to give space to people to be creative. Um, the climate crisis is overwhelming. And when you are on the front lines of it, it is pretty terrifying. And when you can say, all right, well, uh, there are things that I can do. I have ideas. And I'm not alone in those ideas. I'm not alone in, in being able to envision how something can move forward. And I have partners that can help me with finance, partners that can help me with uh, logistical things like permitting for something or uh, being able to help engage other people in this. Um, this is something that is, uh, is, is really critical throughout. And we've, we've learned this a lot through the small grants program um, uh, and are continuing trying to, to learn. And this is why I think these opportunities and being able to share them with you and saying, hey, how, how can we do this together um, is, a, is a, critical, a critical piece of how we tackle the climate crisis. Thanks, Cassie. So just to share um, also some details on how to access funding through the Small Grants Program, if you're not aware of that, um, there's a national coordinator established in every country that you can reach out to and ask for advice on how to apply um, for the program. I'll share at the end of this presentation the link where you can look up the focal point for your country. But importantly, there's a national steering committee set up in every country where um, in, I think in, in over 70% of these steering committees, there's a youth representative on the steering committee guiding the decision on where to allocate the, the funding. Um, uh, so, so really recommend looking into that because over 40% of, of small grants program um, funded projects uh, have uh, active uh, youth participation or, or leadership um, uh, in, in, in their implementation. Um, there is also a, a dedicated innovation program on youth and, and climate uh, on youth and climate change that has uh, been piloted since 2019 through the small grants program. That's currently operating in 11 pilot countries. So those are Armenia, Burundi, uh, Cap Verde, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Malaysia, Sierra Leone, Seychelles, Togo, Tunisia, and Ukraine. And that will likely be spreading to more countries. So worth tapping into this opportunity also uh, to keep an eye on, on uh, which, which countries this specific um, youth and climate change window uh, might, might open up to going forward. Um, so, um, so we've spoken here about the opportunity to involve um, the community in decision making on how to allocate the, the funding, but what are the criteria we should be looking at in determining whether a solution is fit for purpose? Um, uh, which are the solutions that uh, that most, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, most fit in a given community's context that um, funders should be uh, prioritizing, uh, but likewise, some of the criteria that, um, that applicants might uh, need to keep in mind as they put together project proposals um, to make sure they're more likely to succeed in, in accessing funding, but also um, in uh, in having longer term impact. So, Shananin, uh, from your perspective, what are some of these criteria that that are important to to look at? And and I'd like to invite the audience to to contribute here as well on the Menti. Um, again, the link is uh, menti.com, and the code is nine one three two. 3388. 
Um, so what are what criteria are important from your perspective to uh, determining whether a solution is is fit for fit for purpose? Shannonin, over to you. Yes, I believe that in order to actually support the solutions that are being created by the grassroots communities at the local level, it is important that from this side that the call for solutions is like diversified because sometimes it is a form that it has like a single format. So I believe that it is important that it can also be expressed in a different, you know, like uh, communicated well, you know, in different spaces because sometimes that is like the way people actually know about this, this call and to, about the funders, about the support. So yeah, I believe that also in that sense, um, it should be that the communities need to also know how to sell their work because sometimes it is not only that the impact is measurable in numbers, you know, it is sometimes uh, it is represented in how the communities are feeling on what on how it's changing the environment in their local communities. So that is also something about that we have to build capacity on, on the storytelling of this, of this solutions. And because I believe as well that for our perspectives, you know, like also Yongo is made of a lot of grassroots and local communities. So we actually at Legado Gaia, which is like our organization, tried to apply to this grant. But yeah, it is like as we are all volunteers and as we are also students have a lot of, you know, like responsibilities, it is sometimes that we do not have the enough time, you know. So sometimes we do need also like support to be actually able to go through the whole application. So also something as well is that um, sometimes the funders call these like they only provide funds to the trust, you know, by trust. So also I think that is important to uh, build on that, you know, because when we, you actually know like the people who are leading this call for proposals that are leading the funding, it is more likely that you will be, you know, like recognized or like remembered. And that is how I see that a lot of people know that you can actually get to the grants and get like the money and then distribute it. So yeah, I believe that in order to also support the solutions that are being recognized by the communities, it is important to see who is organizing all those solutions and to see how most vulnerable communities like indigenous communities are being included or are they only, you know, like being used as tokens, you know? So I believe that to see how that engagement is actually like creating change inside the organization is important to also know how the solution is going to be replicated. Super, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Agostino, in the context of the Youth for Climate Call for Solutions, uh, what are some of the criteria we're looking at there and, and what should young people in the room know about, um, ab about what we're looking at when reviewing project proposals? Thank you. So, first of all, uh, this is a pilot phase, right? So, it's the first year that we are running this. We are incredibly excited also by the, um, the turnout of the number of applicants and the quality of the applications which we are reviewing now. And, uh, and of course, this is a first step, right? So, it's a first step and so on. Uh, your point is very well received, right? So, in terms of the design going forward, I think we have a lot to improve from uh, these conversations. And, uh, and my point is that what we're doing is only significant as much as a hands-on fertile soil, right? And this is also what Cassis was saying in terms of the years and years of the small grant program, right? So these years and years of success, but also, you know, sometimes failure that sort of created the knowledge within UNDP, right, to be able to then say, okay, this is how Youth for Climate Solutions will be designed. And uh, my thing, my thinking is a question of scale. So we'll go back to this at the end of the panel as well, right? So I think we have all the right ingredients, but we have to make sure that there is enough of them for people to really be able to participate uh, significantly. So in terms of the, the solutions themselves, right? So we start with the what, I suppose, right? So the first criteria that we consider, as Cassie was saying, the crisis is upon us and creates also these anxieties, but we are looking for concrete solutions that have 
a, a way of meaningfully addressing the environmental crisis and the climate crisis. And at the same time, and this is important that both of you mentioned this, is that we're looking at initiatives that can positively impact local communities, right? So we're working a lot through the UNDP network of offices, right, to ensure that this, um, this is the case. And then, because this is a strategic priority for uh, UNDP, but I mean, uh, m much broader than that, we're looking at solutions that intentionally contribute to gender equality and equalities uh, and, and more inclusive uh, and more inclusive societies. Then, you know, we go to the how, right? So, you know, this is not a lot of money, but it's uh, money which is in grant format. And actually, I had this uh, very interesting conversation a couple of weeks ago about the fact that this is actually one of the few um, one of the few um, situations, right, where there is not all these grants um, through a trustee scheme and so forth, right? So we're really sure that this can achieve the results in terms of achieving the right people that want to implement the solutions. But this creates, of course, from NDP, a lot of responsibility in terms of monitoring and so forth. So, you know, we are looking also for solutions which have a structured work plan and approach. So something where for us, it's really not easy, but possible to identify context-specific deliverables. And then we are also looking, as you both said, to the degree of innovation. But when we talk about degree of innovation, we are not really thinking about, you know, something that has to be like, uh, you know, techy or innovative in that sense, right? But, you know, something that has uh, also, you know, a dimension of frugal innovation, where maybe is a solution that has been around for a long time, and what was m missing is this sort of South-South learning, right, that we, we discussed. Apart from these criteria, we, um, we, we are looking to ensure a geographical balance uh, of, uh, of the pool of candidates. And then really we want to, and this is more work for next year, we are really designing how to create these exchanges that Cassis was mentioning, right? So, you know, some solutions can learn from, you know, being cross-disseminated across the various geographical areas. So this is where we are at, and we are very excited to do even better next year. Thank you. Great. So a few things for you to keep in mind as you look out for the next round of the call for solutions, uh, if you're looking at putting together a proposal for that. Um, to move on to the third pillar that we had seen in that framework, um, so we've uh, we've spoken about um, the contextual factors that determine whether solutions emerge in the first place. We've spoken about their design and what funders look for in project proposals. Um, now, in the third round, let's focus on what kind of support youth-led solutions actually need in order to have sustained impact. Um, so, Shananin, to start with you this time, um, what examples have you seen of youth-led solutions that have scaled and what, what did it take in your experience to, to achieve that scale? Yes, from my experience, I was talking also to, to all the panelists about uh, how there was this um, experience that we had a couple of months ago with the caravan that was in the south and how actually this network that was created, it had a lot of support from a lot of international organizations and that was, it was that funding, the one that actually made possible that the caravan was made, you know? So the caravan went through all these territories in the south of Mexico and now, thanks to the networks that were built, is uh, proposed to be next year done in Central America. So yeah, I believe that all these uh, solutions that are being, you know, created, is they have more impact when they network between each other and they create these collaborations and join works. So it is, I think, that way uh, how solutions scale because I also have seen, um, you know, these youth-led solutions like Reard and Utopia, all these networks, they actually build all this impact by engaging with more local communities, you know, by engaging all these solutions that were disseminated from a lot of places and when they join together is how they actually create more impact. So I believe that now that we're here, now that we have these spaces where we can meet each other is how we can build all those connections to actually scale our awful solutions and build impact in the communities we are from. So really speaking to the importance of partnerships and having an outlook from the beginning as to who you need uh, on board to, 
to, to scale or, or impact uh, longer term and could be at community level, at country level, or in fact in, in other countries or, or regions, um, as you correctly pointed out. Um, great. Um, Agostino, uh, coming back to Youth for Climate, um, what, uh, what support are we providing to, to young solution holders or looking at providing to, to set them up for a success? Thank you. No, and uh, again, like going back to to Shannonin's point in terms of how difficult it actually is, you know, to access funding. I think that the work that we're doing through Youth for Climate comes much before uh, the solution holder, right? So the first thing that I think was really, um, for me, was very interesting to witness. I joined UNDP in September, so I, this is the first, I suppose, um, you know, witnessing moment that I had of this sort of like power uh, structure, right, the UNDP has at global level. So it was essentially to see the reach that through the network of the country offices we have to mobilize communities, which was fantastic. But also, I think in terms of learning from our, uh, from our side, you know, you said the first thing, of course, is for opportunities to be, to be known. And here, the role of partnership has been really essential, right? So for instance, through partners such as uh, Connect for Climate, for instance, we were able to like reach a huge, um, a, a huge pool of uh, of applicants. But what really I think made the difference? It's something that we started almost as a sort of you know a little experiment, right? So through the UN Volunteers um, program, we established a window of two months where potential applicants could book in sessions with UNVs. And I would like to acknowledge, especially two in particular, that did tremendous unpaid, I should say, uh, work, Kusefi uh, Isaka Dudbane and Silvia Alfonsi, who basically were the disposal of potential applicants for a period of two months, and they uh, managed to have one-on-one -on -one mentorship with 110 uh, applicants. And 96% of the applicants that went through this uh, said that they found this incredibly beneficial in designing their ideas and defining them further. So the lesson learned for me there is that this that started as a little bit of an add-on compared to other ways should become a structural part of um, of uh, the Youth for Climate offer. And then the very important point here is the point on partnerships, right? Which is also why it's super exciting to be here today at the Youth for Capacity uh, initiative or UNFCCC, because I see Youth for Capacity as you know, aggregating all this capacity out there that is provided by other organizations. And for us, you know, we, we want to partner, of course, with Youth for Capacity, but beyond that, we want to make sure that for each one of the key priorities of the needs of applicants and the people implementing, uh, I mean, the winners, so to speak, uh, we want to accompany them with the right mentorship and programs and through the right partners, right? So we are really quite uh, scientifically, I would say, looking through the partnerships that we had to ensure that the partners that we select for each one of the strategic areas of Youth for Climate are the right ones that can support these young winners, so to speak, in actually becoming the winners, which is, you know, for these solutions that they're proposing to be able to, to achieve their results. Thank you. Great. It's also a call for partnerships for you to reach out to us um, if your organization or organizations in, in your countries um, you think have, have the tools that could um, could help the, the solutions that we'll be working with um, to, to scale. Um, Cassie, a final question from, for you. Um, what does it take uh, from your perspective for grassroots innovations and individual solutions to, to scale or, or drive systems change, change at a more um, systemic level, given the scale of the challenges we're, we're dealing with? Yeah, thank you. I think there, it's worth sort of thinking a little bit about what we mean by scale. Um, because in some in some cases, scaling upwards and being able to have something scale at a massive level is um, is an absolute priority. But in other moments, maybe that's not the best thing to do. And maybe when we talk about scale, it's also about scaling the way that we work. Um, how do we change the way that we work? Um, I was I was in the hallway earlier, and but I, I understand the 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 session before this was on loss and damage. Was that, that right? 
how many of you are hopeful that we are going to resolve issues globally, not just the negotiations, but globally around loss and damage? This is really telling, right? Because loss and damage during your lifetimes is going to be something that the global community has to come together to resolve. And we have to figure out how to get ourselves out of this mess. And the only way we're going to be able to do this is by changing how we have done it for years and years and years. And I think when we talk about supporting local communities, we talk about building capacities, we talk about all of the good ideas that are happening, this is a really talking about how do we change the way that we've done things. And and I think here, when, when we talk about scale, I really encourage everyone for as much as we think about scale as in like, all right, we just have to have this go big. And in many cases, it does need to go big. You know, connect with the NDC processes, connect what's going on at the national level, but also be relentless about how you do it. Be relentless about the methods that you're using, the levels of inclusion, the way that you might, and maybe it's just a matter of you're going to ensure that everything you do is translated into the languages of the communities that need them. You know, things like that that are so important. And, and I think, you know, being able to look at when we are overwhelmed by these problems and these challenges like loss and damage, that it's, it's not just about, okay, what do we do in this moment, but it's also the how and scaling the how. I think is going to be critical moving forward. Thank you. What an important message to, to close on. Thanks, thanks, Cassie. Um, we'll open up for some Q and A, and and Riti, maybe you can let us know if there's any questions or comments coming in online as well. Um, while you think about um, any questions you might have, um, just to share some some links to resources we've mentioned uh, today. So uh, first of all, join the Youth for Climate online um, engagement platform. That's the first link here if you're not already a member. Uh, this is um, uh, a new platform. Uh, it already has 6,000 members, uh, but we're really looking to strengthen it this year. And this is well where we'll be posting uh, crucial opportunities, including the next uh, call for solutions under Youth for Climate. Um, the second uh, resource here is the, the website of the small grants program that I mentioned, where you can find a list of all the national coordinators in your countries that you can reach out to um, about funding opportunities through the SGP. Thirdly, um, have a look also at the website of UNDP's Accelerator Lab Network. As we mentioned, they're present in 115 countries and territories online and they um, uh, online around the world um, and uh, uh, and they have a dedicated solutions mapper in each of these country teams that um, that is there to support in 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 bringing together an ecosystem of, of partners to support grassroots solution holders um, and you'll find their contacts on this website as well for for every country um, I also wanted to flag, um, especially for those of you who come from Asia Pacific, um, you may be aware of the Youth Empowerment Climate Action Platform, YECAP, um, that's been established by UNDP and, and UNFCCC um, in, in Asia Pacific, and they've produced um, at the recent SCAP forum, uh, a really interesting compendium of best practices in youth and, and climate uh, governance. Um, including in fostering youth-led innovation. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. And um, this is a, a first draft that's online and they're welcoming contributions uh, until the 30th of July. Um, and the final version of that document will be submitted to the um, Asia Pacific Climate Week um, in 2023. Um, so those are the resources I wanted to share. And now I already saw a hand was up earlier. Um, so, for any questions, the floor is open. Uh, go ahead. All right. Um, thanks. I think. I'm... All right. Thanks uh, for those presentations. Um, my name is John Bitren Mandu from Zimbabwe. I work with EarthDay.org, as well as AIG Zimbabwe. So, we were a beneficiary of the Climate Promise, the first one, and uh, we did some consultations on NDCs. Um, developed policy briefs, gathered some youth initiatives there. Um, just to ask on the follow-up, 
um, that comes with, you know, this opportunity for small grants. I know it's a competitive world out there. Um, are there specific resources that are probably assigned to the country so that we have continuity and follow-ups and sustainability? Because you reached out, you get some comments, some feedback, and you would want to see those initiatives being implemented. Uh, is there like uh, a specific investment on that or it's another new program that will leave other initiatives that we have invested our time, you know, and our efforts in hanging without um, funding that comes through. For instance, this could be, could have been a first session of training of trainers who can also go and capacitate others, gather more information. And, you know, when we speak of NDCs, again, they are well known within communities. So I would like to see the, you know, the engagement continuing as well. Thank you. Maybe to take another one? So thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kevin Kojo Osa from Togo. Uh, I'm leading a youth uh, organization that is called OJET. And we have uh, applied for the first uh, round of the call for proposals. And I can assure you that it is not really easy as uh, me, uh, particularly, I'm from a French-speaking country. All the proposal is in English. We have tried to uh, do it, but I think for the next, but I, I, I am imagining how it could be difficult for uh, other youths as me who are from, who are speaking French and they don't really, um, it's not easy for them to speak English. So I think, I don't know, but uh, maybe think about to have, uh, to have it in French so that to allow those uh, from French speaking uh, regions to also be able to apply because um, the man in the middle, I forget his name, but was saying that uh, you are trying to deal with geographical barriers, but it will also be good to deal with language barrier. And also going on, um, I think it's also good to look for collaboration between the you for climate participants. From our side, we have been three, uh, one from uh, Belgium, one from Benin, and me from Togo. And we have a strong team that uh, we have. Uh, so it, it has been a very strong team, everybody with his vision of how he think that the project can be done. And then we, 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 we try to have something uh, to apply. So I think you could also be based on those criteria to, to uh, put um, participant, uh, youth for climate participants as they are ambassadors of the uh, youth for climate manifesto to work together to have something uh, between themselves so that to promote collaboration. So um, talking about mentorship, I think it is a very good opportunity, but um, begging you to not put a lot of money in those uh, mentorship program than the, the action that should have uh, done on the ground. Because sometimes that is something happening. Uh, you may see big uh, programs with a lot of money or a lot of funding invested in capacity building for the uh, project um, managers. But when it's come to action on the ground, it's just little funding and sometimes you, you become expert, but to go to action or to go onto the ground, it is very difficult to, to have impact on the vulnerable communities. Thank you very much. Super important points. Thank you so much. Um, I'll also uh, share a few uh, responses, but uh, maybe to open up, uh, maybe to Cassie on the ND, NDC related question. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you, you bring up a, a very, very important point, um, it, which is this this idea of continuity. How do we ensure that we have, um, I, over time, all of the good work that is invested in sort of one project can be, you know, built upon, and you're not starting from scratch for for the other one. Um, uh, the climate promise, yeah, as a part of the climate promise, that we had um, specific uh, financial support for youth in in every single country. Um, it was 127 countries. This next phase has launched with 67 
countries, um, and we're doing a phased approach for uh, for the rest. I'll have to look, and you and I can maybe we can follow up, particularly on the the Zimbabwe case. But we are maintaining that commitment um, to be able to provide uh, support within that NDC process for young people um, in in this phase. So um, it would be great to great to chat about that. Um, and I think too, being able to ensure that you know, all of the good work too that has been uh, going on is is recognized in these new opportunities. And, and maybe we can figure out, especially for, for Youth for Climate or, or things like that, how we, how we th that connection is a part of that process. I think it's, it's a really, it's a really good point. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I also, on this point, I wanted to say that, again, the importance of the fertile soil, right? So, the importance of building from where we are onwards. So for me, the climate promise, for instance, you can't basically like waste, right? The capital of having worked with 86 developing countries, right? So to me, that is basically the quintessential guide that we have also in in all the various multilateral fora, right? So G7, G20, G77, we have to like stay the course, right? Because only things that are tried and fail and retried can actually lead us to success. So this is a fantastic moment of follow-up. So in terms of the, the more practical aspects, uh, Kevin, I think it, your, your feedback is terrific. And uh, so first of all, on the question about languages, right? So uh, it's clear, right, that we're going to do that in that direction, not just French, but of course, uh, at least all the UN um, uh, official languages. And again, I need to thank here uh, the support from the regional apps of UNDP, right, that for instance, for this year, helped us to translate all the material into Spanish, because we were really like uh, struggling with uh, representation from, uh, and, we have a, a good, uh, <laughs> the person that did it for us there. And, uh, and, this, and this, in a sense, was just something that happened through this feedback, this continuous feedback, right? And the reason why it didn't happen before goes to your point on capacity building and funding, right? It, was, it went through the reason is that we try to have all the money that we could spare allocated directly to young people to implement their solutions. But you know, I think that also the learning process here tells us that instead, for instance, more um, more, more investment up from should be done in that sense, right, to, to support the outreach of applicants. And on this, I wanted to acknowledge something really, I would say, moving that happened to me through this uh, process, which was um, the support, the reaching out of the Soka Gokai Institute, the, the a, a cultural Buddhist institute in Italy, and some of the representatives are here today, they reached out to basically just say that they wanted to uh, support young people, right? So they are located a very significant amount of money, right? So they risk to become the main donor in the, if they continue with the support uh, through solutions. But the point that they brought to the table was that they only wanted each single euro of this to get to young people, right? And I think that this is basically our, our guiding um, star in the Youth for Climate Solutions part. And which, which is basically to say that the capacity that we want to use is capacity to make sure that we can access more people and empower them to succeed. And of course, in this, uh, it's crucial to consider the role of partnerships, right? So for instance, again, being here at the uh, Youth for Capacity uh, event for us is also fantastic, right? Because it also tells us that there are synergies that we can build, right? That we don't have to like do everything ourselves, right? So we are here also to structure much more closely this partnership. So thank you, Kevin, again. Just to acknowledge also your point around joining forces across countries, that's really important. And perhaps the engagement platform can be one space for you to, to reach out and identify others you could submit joint project proposals with. Um, but also through that mentorship and learning offer, we want to create um, opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer exchange, right? So for these projects to learn from each other through the implementation process. And uh, yes, just to add to what Agostino was saying, all the partners that we'll be working with on that mentorship and learning offer are doing that entirely pro bono. Um, so kudos to them. Uh, but there's so much out there. Um, there's really no need to, to be developing um, new resources here, but really creating a coalition of, of, of support. Um, Thank you so much. We're, we're at 
time, uh, but uh, just to give Shannonine a chance to come in with any last words um, as well. Yeah, also acknowledging the question of our colleague, yeah, really important that we diversify the way we do these calls for proposals because I believe sometimes it only gets with, you know, like the privileged people that we are allowed to be here, you know, and we have to engage the people that are actually on the ground and they oftentimes do not know like English or even like the way of bureaucracy that implies to get all these funds. So yeah, I do believe that it's something that we have to talk more about and build all these connections to actually create, yeah, create solutions and scale them up. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining this session. We'll be sticking around for a few minutes uh, as there isn't, I think, another session immediately after this one. Maybe Ridi will tell us a bit more about the program for this afternoon. Uh, but just to flag also that on the 12th, so next Monday, um, Youth for Climate will be at the ACE uh, poster gallery uh, session uh, uh, with, uh, with other initiatives. So do come to talk to us there as well. Um, I'm new to the initiative myself, so uh, here to, to meet as many of you as possible. So uh, don't be shy to, to come and say hello. Um, thanks very much also to, to the panelists for, for making time to share some interesting resources and, and advice. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So we'll be breaking for lunch and our next session will start at one. So we'll see you all back here in this room. Thanks. <laughs>